Hello there. My name is Sora Lafuri. Welcome to your favorite human interest chat show, hashtag the African dream. Today we have for our special guest, Dr. Ni Amu Dako, who was born October 25th in Osu, a town in Ghana's capital city of Accra. Though a physician by profession, he wears many other hats, including those of a politician, a philosopher, and a preacher. He also made an attempted run for Ghana's presidency as the founding president of the African Reform Movement Political Party in intending to contest in the 2016 presidential elections of Ghana, but pulled out. The doctor is presently based in Australia with his wife and children. Welcome to Hashtag The African Dream, Dr. Amudaku. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, uh, Ora. Briefly tell us about yourself, um, when and why you left Ghana and fill in any blanks that I might have created in the intro. Like you said from the beginning, uh, I was born in Osu. Now, those who know the history of Ghana understands the place of Osu uh, in the political development of Ghana. And therefore, anybody born there, in my generation, the advantages and disadvantages in terms of political development are quite clear to those who understand Osu and the politics of Ghana. For me, the two most influential people who impacted very much the understanding of the world to me at the early stage were my two grandmothers. They taught me about fairness, hard work, and kindness. Obviously, whatever they taught me was augmented by the teachings of the present church, which actually was first founded in Dosu in 1828 by the Basso missionaries from Switzerland. And my se first seven years of school were in the Presby system. I went to primary school, also probably primary uh, boys school. And then I spent one year in Osu uh, Presby Middle School, which is probably called Susale. The first middle school in Ghana, again, was built by the Basso missionaries in 1843. So that's how I was grounded from the very beginning. Then from there, I went to secondary school at Dodoa, oh, the sorry. University of Ghana Medical School, partly based in Legon and Kolebu. Three years in Legon and three years in Kolebu, and I finished after that. I did my internship in Kolebu, in obstetrics and internal medicine. After that, I worked for a few months before I left to South Africa. Now, why did I go to South Africa? is because of my political mindset. I felt at that point in time, Africa had to show to the rest of the world that we can manage our own affairs. Now, if I had at that point any expertise that I want to take anywhere outside Ghana, it cannot be for me, England or United States, where most of my mates went. I went to South Africa because I believe I could make an impact. Actually, I went there to study. I have moved from a homogeneous black society, which is Ghana, to a mixed society, and you see two cultures side by side, including the attitudes. That place also opened my eyes to the consciousness that what one, what one man has done, another man can do, as Marcus Garvey said. Well, you see, in South Africa, you realize that you had the English investors, chief of, chief of which were with Water Strand in Johannesburg and Cape Town, invest in Cape Town. When Africaners came, they decided, that, no, we're going to build our own investors. So they built trans Africans in Johannesburg and they built Stellenbosch in Cape Town. All right. Different mindset. We want our own. We want our own independence from the English system. And they did it. They did it. Okay. Now, what should be the black response when a black man got power? Well, for me, the black man say, I don't want Rans Africa. I don't want Rans Africans. I don't want before that strength. I'll be my own. You have to have that desire to stand out and to be independent. We, we saw things differently. It was a great opportunity for me to go there and go and learn. In October 1994, I made my plans. I was going to leave the country. So that was the push factor. And at that point in time, there is this opening in South Africa that I believe would need my services. So that was a full factor. Yeah. So, and what kind of medicine are you practicing right now? Yeah, I'm in Melbourne and I'm largely doing emergency medicine 
I do a fair bit of procedures too, day procedures, because of my strong background from surgical training in South Africa. Uh, when you go to a place, you got to look at the system and see where you can fit in best and move forward. Okay, so there's a slight change from being, uh, being trained fully in surgery in South Africa to now working in the emergency department and doing on the side some uh, day procedures. Awesome. In my intro, I made mention of the fact that you made an attempt to run for president in Ghana. Uh, yeah. What was the motivation behind that attempt? The motivation is that I believe that our country needs a new leadership. Okay, our country needs a new leadership, a complete paradigm shift in the way we see politics and with the way we see governance. You know, when Obama came to Ghana, he made a, he made a statement, I'll paraphrase the statement, he said that, make no mistake, development depends on good governance. And this is one ingredient which is missing in so many parts of Africa for so long. Good governance is good leadership and good system of government. And good system of government means a good constitution. So may coming into politics in this way is because I believe that I have studied enough from my own country from the basics, charity begins at home right. to South right. Africa, where I saw the, the evolution of a new black state. Okay, I spent a lot of time in KwaZulu Natal. So I know what happened there right there. Okay, how black people were negotiating this thing. And you see the, the cultures, the, now I understand. Okay, good. I look at the South African constitution. In my opinion, up to today, it's probably the most progressive in the world. Okay. Why do you say so? Because it understood from the word go that this is a multi-racial, multi-ethnic society. And fair representation is key to national cohesion. So their method of representation in parliament is completely different. Now, if you understand it that way, then you see the problem with Ghana and its parliament. Then I learned from there constitutional design. Yeah, I learned from there how the negotiations, what went on, they, they brought the best brains in constitutional law from the world to come there because everybody was keen that it must be South Africa must succeed where other African states have failed. Because they have the infrastructure and they have the history and they have the, the, the money to make a difference. Again, there was always white interest, okay? Western world would not want their cousins there to, 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 to suffer too much. So there was a lot of interest there. So the political debate and negotiation opened my eyes to what is needed to move forward in the country. For the first time, they drew a constitution We started a government of national unity that any party that got 10% of the popular vote will have a minister. And the leader of the second largest party will be a deputy president. So when the election was, they, after the election, the clerk became the leader of the second largest party. His party got 21%. So ideally, he was also the second deputy president and two cabinet ministers. But Mandela gave him five ministers. You see, because a good person sees constitution guarantees as a minimum. Mandela understood that the spirit of that government of national unity is cohesion. So he went beyond, like Jesus Christ said, if someone says, go one mile with him, go the second mile. That's a clear demonstration of somebody who understands uh, nation building. The third party was Nkata Freedom Party, led by Botelezi. But they got 10%. So ideally, there's supposed to be only one minister. But he gave them three. And he made, made Botelezi the Home Affairs Minister. This never happened before. The constitution gave that space 
for the president to act upon and make it better. Right. Yeah. Oh. South African constitution, you understand that a lot of thinking went into it, all right? Well, in South Africa, if something happened. They agreed that the provinces must have their own government. So you had a federal structure. All right, now, just imagine South Africa being a unitary state, state like Ghana and Jacob Zuma appointing all provincial uh, uh, premiers, appointing all city mayors and everything. It would be an absolute disaster. Yeah. They're constantly preventing from doing that, but that's what you have in Ghana. And then I came to Australia. After I finished my tour of duty five years in South Africa, I came to Australia and I saw another level. Now, when I put all these things together, I realized that the fundamental problem of the black man is his consciousness. When in South Africa, I lived in Eastern Cape for a year and I came to contact with members of black consciousness movement. Actually, a niece of Steve Biko was a niece, a niece friend of mine. I live in East London. Steve Biko came from Alice, a stone throw. All right, so I got into that in South Africa. And that's why I named my movement African Reform Movement. I took the <laughs> Zach, I made it African. I took the consciousness and I made it reform. And I left the movement there. So I believe that BCM, the Black Consumer Movement of Steve Biko, set up the template in ARM, African Reform Movement, who complete it. That's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. You espouse very strong views about um, Ghana's constitutional structure, and um, it boils down to um, how parliamentary elections are held. Um, you shared this opinion in the year 2018 during a TV interview in Ghana. And if you don't mind, I would like my viewers to watch this um, just short clip of you speaking about Ghana's parliamentary elections, and then we'll continue from there. And Australia has only 150 members of parliament. Okay, and they are managing very well. Now, there is no basis for Ghana to have 225 members of parliament. We can do easily with 100, easily with 100. But it's not only that. I believe that the way we let people to parliament is also fraud. It's fraudulent. Let me give you an example. You know the talency by elections they did. Mm -hmm. Now, the person who won the talency by election actually got 32% of the vote. So it's a minority MP. Because 58% did not vote for him. But he is in parliament because 42% voted for him. The same thing happened. Um, in fact, in the last election, in Greater Accra, probably 30% of the MPs in Greater Accra now are all minority. They got less than 50% of the votes of the people they are representing. That is fraud. Because if, we are, if, a, if it's a majoritarian system, anybody who goes to parliament must have majority, not the highest vote, the majority. Okay. So if we have three parties, we have three strong parties or even for strong party, it's very possible that somebody can go to parliament if only 30 percent of the vote. That is fraudulent. Because it should never be like that. If it's the majority vote, if you're talking of majority rule, then you can have a minority representing. It's not majority rule. It's not majority rule. Majority rule means that the person who goes to represent the people has the majority of votes, not just the highest vote. Welcome back, viewers. This is Earl Furry of Hashtag The African Dream. Joining us for our special guest from Australia is Dr. Ni Amu Daku. And we just saw a video of him sharing his uh, opinion on um, parliamentary elections in Ghana. Now, Doc, based on your comments from the video we just shared, talk briefly about Ghana's recent election and what you think could be done better next time as far as electing people into parliament in Ghana is concerned. All right, thank you very much. Ah, this is a big topic, but I'll just summarize it. First of all, if we have a dirty jar, the water will be dirty. We can move out for everywhere. To have a good system, first of all, you have to deal with the jar. And as far as I'm concerned, the job for elections in Ghana 
from the outset is the Electoral Commission. Okay, I've written essentially about this. The Electoral Commission, I'm talking of the structure of the Electoral Commission as it is in the Constitution. I wrote integrity beyond a flawed constitution. When Charlotte say was appointed in 2015, and I talk about it extensively, so I won't go there again, but fundamentally, you cannot have a system that the one who appoints is also a competitor. So what is the remedy to that, in your opinion? The remedy to that is to what I suggested, that in my book, uh, The Fifth Republic, I put it in a different way. I've, I've slightly changed it because um, I think there's a better way of doing it. Fine. What I'm saying today is this. We need an independent electoral commission. That's not appointed by the president, but that is filled by statutory officers. We need five member committee. It represents the chief justice, at least, level of court of appeal, government statistician, IGP, and the auditor general. Now, these four people would then form like, a, uh, would then form the electoral commission like a board. They will advertise for the chief electoral officer who would then work like the present chair of the electoral commission. Now, they will advertise and interview and appoint a Ghanaian to fill that position. And that Ghanaian will be answerable to them. So he will be the fifth member of the commission and the secretary to the commission. Now, so we have the commission, which are written about electoral committee. Then we have the next level with the electoral secretariat. The electoral secretariat will be like a minister, like the ministry. And his CEO or his chief, uh, uh, chief uh, director will be the electoral commissioner as we have it now, okay? That's the one who will be appointed by the electoral commission. He or she will lead this quasi-ministry. And they will have six departments, elections, finance, law, education, and publicity, research, and data, or something, six or six of them. Because now we have a quasi-judicial body with no department, of law, with no legal department. If the AC is sued, we have to go and hire a lawyer from outside. You know, much thinking did not go into the creation of this AC. Uh, and then this body, this body um, of five members will actually be answerable to a joint or to, to, to a parliamentary committee, a bipartisan parliamentary committee of 10 members, five from each party, to see that so that the transparency will be clear. You have um, um, mentioned in the past that you feel Ghana's parliament is somewhat unconstitutional. And you, um, you just explained about uh, the, the role of the EC and how it somehow directly or indirectly helps fuel this unconstitutionality. Um, yeah. You also are a passionate um, believer in Africa and um, yeah. you um, espoused an ideology or a philosophy um, termed Afrimocracy. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Afrimocracy and how you feel it is the way forward as far as Africa governing herself is concerned to bring about um, political and economic liberation. Perfect, perfect. A democracy basically is um, democracy, democracy brewed in African ports. Okay, it's before the white men came. We were governing ourselves. I was brought up in a traditional setting in the chieftaincy system. So I understand how our system works. Let me just give you a brief example of how our system works. Let me use Ga, for example. In Ga, there are two gates, Ajimankesewe and Apropongwe. In these two gates, there are two houses. In Ajimankese way, we have Amugiwe and Taki Komiwe. In Akropong, we have Abolapia and Delkochuru. Now, when the mantle falls and it's a rotatory system. So we can say that 
looking at the two gates, you can say we have two parties. Okay, we have two political parties. These two political parties, are they, are they adversarial or they are consensual? How do they manage ourselves? Okay. Now, when the mantle falls on a particular house, the head of the family will pick one, two, three eligible candidates and send them to the JASA, which is the Electoral Commission. Now, they will also vet these people, do a bit of background check here and there, and decide on one of them to become the government chair. Now, what happens to those who do not become government chair? They don't become opposition. But they also have roles to play in the kingdom. So how come that we cannot think deep to see that, okay, we are competing for the same position. But what happens if I win? What happens to my friends, other citizens who compete with me that do not win? How do we, how do we link them up with the rulership of the country? And there's been a functioning system of governance politically. You reference Ghana particularly, but I assume, you know, generally across the continent of Africa. So we should not be able to not manage our affairs properly. There is no reason for us not to manage our affairs. Look at something. You've been to the UK before. Yeah. The United Kingdom there became what it is in 1707. Okay. The Ashanti Kingdom became what it is now in 1701. The Ashanti Kingdom is older than the United Kingdom. And it's much older than the United States. What are some of the tenets of Afrimocracy that makes it workable? Okay. Let's assume we are talking of political parties. Okay. The key in Afrimocracy is that sovereignty resides in the people. At elections, they transfer that sovereignty to their elected leaders. Now, how is it that when somebody gets 51% mandate, he assumes 100% power? What happens to the 49%? You see, how can somebody get 50.1% and get 100% of power in the country that he appoints everybody? What happens to the 49.9? What happens to their mandates? All right. We cannot behave like we don't think. We just can't do that because we have to understand that this country called Ghana is a multi-ethnic country cobbled together by Imperial Britain. Now, the challenge is trying to weld this patchwork together in an inseparable way that everybody will feel included. And that is the main thing when you read chapter six the, of our constitution, the new constitution, which talks about the directive principles for state policy. And then it's got so many political objectives, social objectives, cultural objectives, education objectives, and all those things there. And it says that this principle should guide every Ghanaian, the judges, the president, everybody when it comes to policy formulation and implementation, because the end game should be a free and just society. Okay, that is the only way we can ensure national cohesion. So coming back to how government is structured and why I'm so dead against the constitution in many ways is because this, that's not, this spirit of the constitution, so to speak, that says that this is overall, this is overarching principle. We must all try and fit into it. When you begin to read different other chapters, you think you see that it dissipates, it disappears somehow. Because by the time you finish the whole thing, you realize that actually the constitution has made the head of state the state. So we go back and see how Ashanti has survived 300 years. 
of his monarchy with all his problems and see why there is no problem and trade between the Asantini and his number two, the Mamponhini, and with the other uh, paramount chiefs, and they are able to sit there and do things that until we go back and see how did they do it? We are not going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Um, you, you are indirectly calling for an overhaul or some major amendments in the current um, Ghanaian constitution. Um, I'm actually you- calling for a fit republic. Okay. <laughs> it's entirely to Ghanaians to decide whether what is happening, the way they have been governed from 1992 up to now, is what they want. It's entirely up to them. All right? It's entirely up to them whether this is the way they, they, they thought it would be when we were voting for this constitution. You see, people who refuse to learn from small things can never learn from big things. It's impossible. You know it's in both, right? You know it's in both. Right, the Jamaican runner. That's right. It doesn't matter how well he ran. Doesn't matter how well he ran. At the end of the race, he wasn't given the gold, the silver, and the bronze medal. Somebody else got a silver medal, another person got a bronze medal. Now, it's a very simple thing for others to learn from. It doesn't matter the intensity of the competition. At the end of the day, somebody will win. Somebody will come number two. Somebody will come number three. But they all stand on the podium and they all get something. So it not, it's that it never becomes a do and die affair. It's why winner takes all. <laughs> it's a very simple thing. It's, it's, so it's, in a democracy, right. I said 80-20 formula. What is 80-20 formula? 80% of cabinet positions will be shared among parties that go more than 5% of the ballot. So if a party gets 10%, that party will get two ministerial positions. I look at it as 25 ministerial positions, okay? If the party got 40%, that party will get eight ministerial positions. So if you have 25 ministerial positions, 20 will be shared among the parties based on what they pulled. All right, now the remaining 20, will then go to the eventual winner because gold is not the same as silver. You understand what I'm saying? So the gold medal is the 20% that will go to the president for winning. So that if the president party, for instance, if the president party got 55%, it means he's going to get 11 of the 20 seats, of the 20 positions. And then we'll get additional five because the 30% gives him five seats. So then, he, what, what did he get? What, what, the, at the end of the day, he's going to have 16 out of the 25 uh, cabinet positions. Because he didn't get 100% of the votes. Dr. Ni Amudaku, thanks for making time to join us from Australia. Folks, um, see his uh, official website on the screen. Um, check him out, connect with him, and Thank you so much for sharing your views with us. We appreciate you, sir. All right. My pleasure. My pleasure.